Maranatha, everyone. This is Pastor Jed, and this is another edition of my weekly video blog, Apologetics and Prophecy, where we like to take current events, put them through a, an apologetical and biblical lens to see just how close we are to the return of our Lord. And of course, the title of today's prophecy update is Money, Money, Money. And of course, the song resounds through many of our heads, but it's also the topic that's pretty much on everybody's mind with the I, with inflation and with gas prices and with everything that's going on, we can't help but see it's starting to affect our lives, money, and what's happening with the economy. It's very important. It's on our minds. But where is it going and why is it here? And so I thought that it would be important that we build a background uh, prophetically from the word, what we see coming, and then what money is in the scripture, and then how it's being used in the world today to bring us to where we are right now. Of course, we know prophetically that in Revelation chapter 13, verses 17, 16 and 17, it says that this false prophet that comes, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, freight free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we already know, all us prophecy teachers know that this is in the future. And in order for this to happen, there has to be a way for money to be centralized for one person in the world on a global scale to be in control of what you and I can buy and sell. And so we know there has to be a one world economy and there has to be in order for the beast to be able to take control of it and use it the way that he is in the scripture. But we also know about money that in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 it says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, the kinds of, the kinds of in there is really just implied. If you have the New King James Version, it's in italics. They kind of put it in there to kind of make it understandable in, in English, but in 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 reality, it's for the love of money is a root of all evil. That's actually what it says. It is a root, not maybe maybe not the root of all evil, but it is a root of all evil. So they put that's why they put kinds in there. So in reality, money is a root of evil. It is a root of all evil, as a matter of fact. And so because even in the Christian church, many have strayed from their faith, from greediness and pierced them through with many sorrows. How many... Christian leaders do we even know about that we could we could we could you know count them off the top of our head just that have been you know brought down because of greediness because of money because of power and so we see that this 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 money that has a strong influence is a root of all evil it all evil money in its root in its root form is will cause evil and of course we know the famous statement by Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, no one can serve two masters where he will either hate the one or love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon was a word for the monetary system, the commercial marketplace of money banking system of that time. And so if you're you're if it's if he's saying you cannot serve God or Mammon because you're going to serve one or the other, well, if you're not serving God, who are you serving? You're serving Satan. The Bible's very clear about that. So, what about our money? Why are we in the place that we are in today? Why do we see inflation running out of control? And we see after the last two years, we're seeing this push for globalism. Does all this fit into place? Well, we have to go back about 100 years to understand how our money system here in the United States works. And of course, it started with what's known as the Federal Reserve System. Now, if you go to their own website, they'll say the Federal Reserve System is, a, is the central bank of the United States, founded by an act of Congress in 1913, the Federal Reserve's primary purpose was to enhance the stability of the American banking 
system. So basically they, they, but what they don't tell you, what they don't tell you is the secret behind it, how it was formed, how it was pushed through Congress late at night during Thanksgiving when nobody was there. Uh, there was a skeleton crew of people left in Congress to push this thing through and it was signed into law it, 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 in, in the secrecy of everything because of what it was. Now, there was a secret meeting that happened that made the foundation, and you can go to Jekyll Island and actually go to their their their, their uh, historical website, and it says, the secret expedition that formed American sacred Central Bank. Just before Thanksgiving in 1910, U.S. Senator Nelson Aldrich of Rhode Island invited six members of America's banking elite to a covert retreat on Jekyll Island. This was before the first trans transcontinental call placed by the president of AT&T from a phone on Jekyll in 1915. So this was five years before the first transcontinental phone call. It was before the internet and cable news. Secrets could be taken to the island and secrets would stay there. Wishing to avoid public scrutiny and pesky reporters, the group dubbed the First Name Club, because no one used last names during the rail trip down, agreed on the cover of a gentleman's duck hunt. One attendee even toted a borrowed shotgun. Instead, they holed up for nine days at the Jekyll Island Clubhouse to discuss how to prevent another panic of 1907, when a run of banks nearly collapsed the United States economy. J.P. Morgan, a Je Jekyll Club member, personally bailed out banks, New York City and the New York Stock Exchange. Out of those clandestine meetings emerged a draft legislation that would eventually form the Federal Reserve Banking System, the country's central bank network, and a financial security net that remains in place today. So we have the, these, these bankers that were running all the main banks in the United States took a senator, a U.S. senator, out to this meeting and they were de deciding how to use the government, lobby to the government, how to centralize the money so that they would have control of it. If There's a good book called The Creature of Jekyll Island. You can see it's by Griffith. You can find the video on of his lectures on YouTube. Very good. Uh, very lengthy, but he explains exactly how the federal system works because the Federal Reserve System is not federal and it's not reserve. It is, it is basically, they handle the printing of money for the Treasury Department. Now, Congress, ele or the, the, it's an executive branch leader that leads the Federal Reserve, but it is a private entity that prints money for the United States and, and decides the interest rates for loans for banks to borrow loans on. So the money is centralized. That's why when it says a Federal Reserve note, it is not a U.S. Treasury note. It is not, it is not reserved currency, meaning there is nothing to back it except the promise to repay. It's what we call the fiat money system that a lot of worlds use. But this was all pushed by these globalist bankers that long before even this meeting happened, they were pushing the world to a global government and global power. This is something that's been going on for a long time. And you can go back and you can trace these people from this meeting at Jekyll Island all the way up to the International Monetary Fund, to the World Bank, even up to now what we call the World Economic Forum. And all of these things, all of these systems are connected to George Soros and company. All of them are attached to these uh, world um, dominating forces. They want to dominate the world. But right now, since the World Economic Forum in the last few years, we have, and it's actually been going on for a while, but right now that we are no longer, the world governments are no longer what's controlling the world. It is the corporations that are controlling the world. They're all run by these multi-corporations. That's why when we buy and sell, we're already at a global market. When I use my cell phone to purchase something using my Bank of America account, Bank of America, it says America, but I can use the same app anywhere on the world to buy whatever I want online or there if I'm there present. I don't need to exchange money. I don't need to do anything. I can purchase it with my phone. 
because we're already there. We already have, but that system's being controlled privately. It's not centralized by the different governments. The transactions are done by the app or by the people in the corporation, but it's really convenient for us because it sets up a global system already. So the corporations are already in this. And so that's why when we, we see the, you know, we, we talk about the big people like the Zuckerbergs and the, the Elon Musks and these other people, but they're, and even, even Jeff Bezos, they're small potatoes compared to BlackRock and Vanguard. These are the big money corporations that are actually running the world. And of course, they replaced the JP Morgans of the last century of the Jekyll Island time. But now they're moving from the Fed and they want a global system. It's almost like they have what we had just this last week was Davos. And Davos, run by the World Economic Forum, is basically Jekyll Island 2.0, moving the world to a global currency, global centralized bank, which will be used by the Antichrist to control all the buying and selling and make it possible that nobody can buy and sell without taking his mark or the, the name, the number of his name. But of course, Davos is, is full of its own issues. Davos elite reassesses globalization amid turmoil and pandemic and war, the turmoil, pandemic and war for more than half a century. The world's richest and most powerful just like they did in Jekyll Island, decamped to this glitzy ski town where they have mostly been able to agree on one thing, that globalization is good for countries, corporations, and people. So they agree. This is their, They're not hiding in it. You've heard how many times have we shown you New World Order, New World Order, New World Order. They're pushing it. They're going to succeed, by the way. That is for sure. For... Um, now, two years into a worldwide pandemic with war raging in Europe and a broken supply chain weighing on the economy, top world leaders, chief executives and economists are re reassessing globalization and, and newly emphasizing resilience. One dom once dominant players like China and Russia are largely missing and companies, not not countries, companies, are talking about moving manufacturing hubs closer to their customers. Is globalization dead? Asked one of the 300 panels at the World Economic Forum's annual gathering this week. The verdict, it's complicated. But signs of a shifting world order and the trepidation about exactly where things will land permeated the five-day conference and its many champagne-filled sorees, drunken parties, in other words. And so we see that in Davos, they're still moving forward with the Great Reset. They're still moving forward with their plan of moving everything to this global economy, and they're using the corporations to do it. You see headlines like this, consumer settlement mir mir mired at 10-year low amid persistent inflation, University of Michigan survey finds. I mean, the, the sediment we see uh, is at a 10 year low because of the inflation and everything, but this is all pre-planned. It's all predestined. They had planned this out from the beginning. They want national central currencies to fail. It's all on purpose because if they fail, then somebody has to fill that vacuum. And that's when the, either it will be the IMF or a new foundation laid out by the World Economic Forum, but basically, just like JP Morgan says that they bailed out the banks and then used their influence to form the Federal Reserve, how much more will these uh, George Soros or a, a world power will come, you know, somebody with the money will come to bail the world out and bring us back into utopia? Sounds a lot like what maybe the Antichrist might do. So it just shows you how close we are. But we can show, we can tell you that how they're doing it right now, how they're pushing this forward is they're using a thing called E, uh, it's, it's called ESG, environmental, uh, social, and governance is how they're uh, pushing these scores. And they're using it to Vanguard and BlackRock, the big money people, the people that are pushing pretty much control all the money on the earth, all the, the, the monetary funds, the, the, the stock markets, the mutual funds, they're all run by these companies, these big money companies that are giant. They're huger than Microsoft or Apple or, or, or Amazon. They're just, they're just mammoth companies 
that control how they tell other companies underneath them in their little portfolios how to run their business. If they don't fall into the environmental category, if they fail at social categories, if they fail in their governance categories, meaning they have to be inclusive on all these things. And so it doesn't surprise us to see Tesla just this last week being kicked out of the S&P 500's ESG index. The article says the S&P 500 booted electric vehicle maker Tesla from its ESG index as part of an annual update to the list. Meanwhile, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and even oil and gas multinational ExxonMobil were still included on the list. The S&P P500 ESG index uses environmental, social, and governance data to rank and effectively recommend companies to investors. Its criteria includes hundred, hundreds of data points per company that pertain to the way businesses affect the planet and treat stakeholders beyond shareholders, including customers, employees, vendors, partners, and neighbors. And, and so we see all of this happening and they're using this to control the world markets and they're trying to bring everything under control of these entities that are ultimately just puppets of the strings of the world economic forum and they're they're listening to the soroses and all these people and pushing companies and of course Elon Musk comes out and wants to take the biggest social platform on the planet and open it up to free speech and now he's being attacked by the globalists from every side and so it shouldn't surprise us that they do these things, even though Tesla makes electric vehicles. Hello, they're the most environmentally friendly vehicles on the planet, but yet, but yet they don't. But but uh, Exxon makes makes the list. It tells you that it's not about ESG; it's about power and it's about globalism. And so they want to control the narrative. And so all the things that are happening today is because. The globalists want economies to collapse. And so the way to do it is by pushing us to continue to print more money. And that's what's causing inflation. Our inflation is caused because we printed all this money to save the world from COVID. We doubled our debt in, in two years and it basically made the price of the dollar worth nothing on the world market. And so everything is going up in price for us. Everybody, you know that. You just go to the store, go buy your gas. But really, it's not inflation or recession that's a problem. It's something called stagflation. And uh, the definition of that is economic stagflation or recession inflation is a situation in which the inflation rate is high, the economic growth rate slows, and unemployment remains steadily high. It presents a dilemma for economy economic policy since actions intended to lower inflation might exaggerate the unemployment. This is basically how it's working. Our country is in this huge debt problem. Inflation is growing as we continue to print more money than we bring in. We don't have anything to base this money on just on the promise of repay and interest rate. As we continue to flood the market with these freshly printed bills, it causes inflation to go up. Well, in order for the, the, the Fed to control inflation, it has to raise the interest rates, which causes inflation to go down, but it also slows down the economy so people aren't spending all this money that they have that's cheap money. And so um, we have a problem. And it's really designed, it's, it's gotten so crazy and chaotic because there's no way we'll ever pay the debt off that disaster is going to come. But we know that disaster will come. But we also know this was all planned. It's nothing new, it doesn't surprise us. We know it's coming, but what's going to rise out of the ashes is a one world economy, a one world government, an antichrist system that will be there ready for this one person to come on the scene, this one person who will control it and use it to his advantage to cause people to that will not worship him to take to not be able to buy and to sell. What we know is that time has come and time is short. We know this system is being set in place as we speak. We need to be ready. We need to know that Jesus is coming again soon. And if you're playing around with sin or you're, or you're not quite sure whether or not you're secure in Christ, today is the day that you need to get right. You need to repent. You need to put your faith and trust in him. You need to turn to the Lord while there's still time. If you're living and breathing and listening to this message, it's not by accident. 
It's because you realize and know that you need to get right with the Lord. And Jesus said that if all who come to him, he will by no ways cast out. The Bible says that if you put your faith in him, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. So you need to repent, turn from your sins and put your faith and trust in him today. For you and I, they're living in these times and seeing these things happening. Don't let the mammon, don't let the, the love of money distract us from what's important because what's important is Jesus and he's coming again soon. There should be an urgency in our life to see the gospel go out, to see people get discipled, to see people grow in the word, to be encouraged, to wait upon him and not upon their finances, not for a leader to come and fix all our problems. Because Jesus is the only one. He's already fixed our problem and our problem with sin. And he's dealt away with it. We should rejoice because we have a heavenly inheritance ahead for us. So with that said, I just want to encourage you. Don't be, don't be alarmed by these things. No, they've been prophesied. They have to come to pass. So just hold on tight. Jesus is coming again soon. And with that said, I want to end like I always start. Maranatha.